यू आर लाइव नाउ Welcome everyone to the WSPOS Worldwide Webinar Series. This is the season two. So if you're not enjoying Netflix, this is a good time to log in. You will definitely enjoy this webinar. Uh, today's topic is ocular surface diseases in children, and the day today is Saturday, January twenty third. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people all over the world. As I'm talking, I'm getting a feed that we have. people joining in from portugal sweden lebanon egypt malaysia and singapore so that's going to be a fantastic webinar um my name is vishal janji i work at the university of pittsburgh my co moderator here today is max serafino from italy and we have a list of stellar speakers um a few housekeeping points uh, as always we rely a lot on our audience to ask us questions um this webinar like the previous ones Uh, will be live streams on live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. You gotta type your questions in the comment sections. Uh, panelists will uh, try and answer as many questions as possible. Um, at the end of the day, the compiled answers will be uploaded on the WSPOS website. For the Mentimeter, you are encouraged again to go to www.menti.com. This is the passcode for today. Don't panic if you if you can't note it down. We're gonna repeat that time and again in the comment section. You can also scan this QR code to connect. The attendance and participation certificates will be emailed. If you need one, please send an, uh, send us an email to program at wspos.org. So without further ado, um, we have four speakers today. I'm gonna uh, you know go through the list of the speakers. Our first speaker is Erin Stahl. She is the section chief of pediatric ophthalmology at Children's Mercy Hospital at Kansas City. She is also an associate professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She is the fellowship director uh, for pediatric ophthalmology fellowship program at the same hospital. As you can see, that Dr. Stahl is is engaged in. The second speaker, uh, Bhupesh Bagga. I've known Bhupesh for many many years now. He's a fellowship trained ophthalmologist at the prestigious Elvi Prasad Institute at Hyderabad in India and he focuses mainly on corneal ulcers and keratitis. He's also involved in, in managing pediatric uh, complex corneal diseases and ocular surface disorders. He's a principal investigator of grants uh, both from the Indian Council of Medical Research and Department of Science and Technology the top two uh, funding bodies Uh, in india his his major research in is on hsv keratitis and pythium keratitis who patients actively involved in teaching and postgraduate fellows mike's over to you i'm so sorry max i'm supposed to introduce you max serafino the lovely lovely gentleman and an excellent pediatric ophthalmologist my co moderator today He's the head of Peds Ophthalmology Unit at the IRCCS Gaslini Institute in Ch at Children's Hospital Genoa, Italy. Uh, he's also uh, the director of teaching uh, residents in ophthalmology at the University of Milan in Italy. He focuses mainly on research uh, on strabismus and pediatric cataract. Over to you, Max. Now. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you for introducing me. And welcome uh, everybody. Welcome everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening from all over the world. So uh, it's an honor to me um, to introduce my friend Dominique Bramongignac. She's a professor of ophthalmology, head of department at the Necker University Hospital for sick children in Paris, Optara. Uh, of Tara Rare Eye Disease Center, head of orthotic department, always in Paris University, and associate researchers at Insem Unit One One Three Eight Team Seventeen. Please, Michel, next slide. And also, it's a pleasure to me introduce Eduardo Villani. I have I have worked uh, with him for many years. He's an associate professor of ophthalmology in uh, at the University of Milan. He's a great ophthalmologist. His clinical and surgical activity focuses on ocular surface and anterior segment disease in adults and pediatric patients. He is devoting a major effort towards education and teaching. 
is an invited speaker to more hundred scientific meetings, uh, author many, many, many um, um, peer-reviewed full-length uh, papers. And uh, currently he serves uh, as an editorial board member of YOV, IOFBVS, the Ocular Surface, and uh, International Ophthalmology and the Global Ambassador of the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. Next slide. Max, we gotta go to the first speaker now. No, just I have to introduce you. Just go with the, 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 the next slide. I will. And it's a, a, a pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Vishal Janji is a professor of ophthalmology at University of Pittsburgh at School of Medicine, trained at All India Institute of Medical Science and Indian University of Melbourne, Australia. A fellow uh, ARVO, Cornell Society board member, and also associate editor of Thalmic Research and section editor of BJO. So now uh, we start the webinar with the first speaker. So Irene, it's all yours. Thank you. All right. So today I'm going to talk about meibomian gland dysfunction and the role of meibomian um, oils. Um, let me get this. Oh, all right. Um, so I work in Kansas City, and um, financial disclosures include uh, Treehouse, Glaucose, and Santin, which are not relevant to this talk. Um, just a reminder um, about meibomian glands and the oil layer of our tear film that meibomian glands line the inside of our eyelids, orifices are at the eyelids. And the most important part of these glands is producing the oil layer that then stabilizes the tear film. So without that oil layer, we have fast evaporation of our aqueous layer, which then you know, leads to all sorts of different kinds of ocular surface disease. Um, so it's really important that we have a healthy uh, meibomian glands and meibomian oil to be able to have a healthy ocular surface and tear film. So there's three main problems um, that can occur with the meibomian glands, which kind of all fall under the category of meibomian gland dysfunction. We can have poor oil quality, we can have occluded meibomian glands, and then we can have a reduced number of meibomian glands. When we talk about poor oil quality, you know, I think we're all familiar with that picture on the left where you express the glands and you can call it toothpaste, turbid, um, you know, bacteria laden, granular. But you know, when you go to push on those meibomian glands and this is what comes out, you know, you know you have problems uh, within the glands and then on the ocular surface as well. The photo on the right is actually directly after meibomian gland probing. And that's the time when you see oils, I think, as they're really meant to be, that you probe and there's no bacteria in there, there's very little inflammation, and they come out crystal clear. Um, and so the difference between healthy oil and um, you know, diseased oil. When I talk to families about lid hygiene, I equate these oils to vegetable shortening. I don't know what across the world that is, but you know, a thick fat, um, as opposed to a vegetable oil, um, which is thin and clear. And so when we talk about um, the role of heat in lid hygiene, it's to turn that fat into, into something that's mobile and can be expressed. So obviously this is what we want. Another problem can be if the meibomian glands are just occluded. And so I think in children, this is a very small percentage of kind of our BKC kids, which I know is a separate topic, um, but they get these greasy caps over each gland opening. And it's something I look at on every patient exam is can I, you know, I express glands on almost everyone I see with an ocular surface disease. And sometimes you just see this where nothing comes out, no matter how hard you squeeze, nothing comes out. And you can actually see that greasy cap. And then finally, as far as the, the final problem, and, and I don't have a lip of you, but this is looking at the number of meibomian glands. And uh, my second fellowship was in refractive surgery. So I spent a lot more time thinking about meibomian glands and you know the sort of fine points of the ocular surface. And this is something that we used in adults um, to show kind of the health and number of, of meibomian glands. So obviously when we don't have healthy meibomian glands, we can have all sorts of symptoms. Um, from the more mild, you know, complaints of burning and redness leading to, you know, then corneal involvement with light sensitivity, 
moving into corneal inflammation, scarring, and then eventually vision loss. And this is all on the ocular surface side. You know, in addition to that, we certainly have plenty of people who are coming with styes and chalazians and hordeolums that are related to blocked meibomine glands as well. So kind of going back to our bread and butter treatment for meibomine gland disease is, is very similar to our treatment for, for BKC. Um, to address the oil quality and gland number, we're going to, you know, focus on reducing inflammation. And steroids aside, you know, kind of going back to the basics, we talked about lid hygiene. Um, I do recommend omega-3 supplements in kids. I think they're low risk and in the adult literature, you know, have some uh, support. Um, gland expression, which I do in clinic, um, and potentially I, I take a handful of kids every year to the OR to express their meibomian glands because I just need to get that stuff out and moving um, to be able to start st or stop the cycle um, of their meibomian gland disease. And then um, rarely, rarely, but I use oral antibiotics for meibomian gland dysfunction alone. It's mostly when we have severe corneal involvement that I'll move to oral antibiotics. What I did want to talk a little bit more about was meibomian gland occlusion. And even though it's rare, I'm not sure it's always looked for in children. And then, you know, I don't think there's, there's much to do about it. So manual expression is one thing, you know, if you can squeeze hard enough in clinic and if they can get a good enough cadence to their, to their scrubbing at home, um, sometimes you can get those open. But I have a handful of kids every year as well that I can't, they have terrible ocular surface. I can't get those orifices open. They're all closed. And so I'll take them to the OR for my bony and gland probing. There's lots of different tools you can use for this. Um, I use a sterile safety pin in the OR. I found out there was one in our lacrimal tray. And as I was trying to figure out what fit into that gland, it, that, that was the one that worked the best. Um, there's commercially available meibomian gland expressors and probes in the middle of the mask and probe. Um, I actually haven't used any of these because my safety pin works really well. I'm gonna see if I can get this video uh, to work. All right, so like I said, it's probably five or 10 kids a year that I take to the OR to do this. This is a case that, you know, an autistic child who hadn't opened his eye in a long time, really bad ocular surface. Um, but if you look along there, you can see that greasy cap on every one of the meibomian glands. And as I go along here with my safety pin, you can almost see the pop and you can feel it almost every time. That one, maybe not so much. Um, but as it comes down, you push and you just feel it break through. And then if you come behind, that's where my oil picture was from. And, you know, with my big fingers in there, um, squeeze and you can see the ones that are open. You get this nice, clear bubble of oil. But if I move right next to it, where I haven't, um, where I haven't probed, I've probed down here. Um, right there in the middle where I haven't probed, it's a little out of focus, but you can see nothing comes out no matter how hard I squeeze on the areas that aren't probed. And then sometimes you can't really find the glands. It just looks like a solid eyelid with no glands. And I found that if you kind of take the tip and scratch it along, you can find them. And then there's some like this, that as soon as you probe it, just stuff starts pouring out. So I do this to both lids or both eyes, both lids, and all the glands that I can see that are occluded. And you can see down here on these uh, inferior glands that you just push, you pop, you can almost see it even better there. And I try and be as atraumatic as possible because I don't want uh, to produce more inflammation um, in this process. And then afterwards, um, I put them on a relatively short course of steroids with the hope um, you can see that nice clear oil coming out um, with the hope that they'll stay open um, longer term. And in my experience of doing this, I've found that um, I found that um, they can stay open for six months, 12 months. I have had to repeat it, but in most cases, I don't see these kids back. Like they're, they don't come back because they don't need to come back and they're better. Um, I have one or two kids that immediately reoccluded, and we've just really focused on lid hygiene for them um, because it, it wasn't that effective. So um, it's just an idea in kids where you're really struggling to figure out why their ocular surface is so bad and a relatively simple solution. Um, I can't, I haven't had a child that I can do it awake. 
So if I have to do it, we go to that alarm. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And I'll hand it off to Eduardo. Thank you so much, Erin, for that fantastic talk. Um, our next speaker is uh, Eduardo Villani from Italy, and he's going to talk about pediatric dry eye. Eduardo, all yours. Eduardo, Eduardo before speaking, just uh, let me tell everyone that uh, so far we have people connected from uh, Portugal, Sweden, Lebanon, Egypt, Malaysia, Singapore, USA, Indonesia, France, Italy, uh, Argentina, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Greece, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Peru, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, UK, Ireland, Ireland, and Philippines. So thank you everyone for joining us. Okay, Eduardo, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Max, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to the WSPUS, to the organizers. And um, I'm very glad to be here talking about uh, pediatric dry eye. This is a, a bit challenging and a, a, a bit neglected uh, topic. And um, I think that, that it is a bit difficult to put together expertise in ocular surface and expertise in pediatric ophthalmology. I have had a great chance to do that in the last 10 years from when I started my collaboration with my mentor, Professor Palonucci. And in this way, we had a chance to put together a background on ocular surface and a background on pediatric dry eye. And I think that is an important and interesting topic. These are my, sorry, these are my financial disclosures, not relevant for the topic of this presentation. And uh, so in the next few minutes, uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, uh, three issues. Um, one about the uh, peculiarities of a pediatric tear film and ocular surface. Uh, one about the relevance of pediatric dry eye is uh, very rare cases uh, or a, a relevant issue. And uh, trying to move from adults to children, we try to mention what we know and what we don't know about pediatric dry eye. So, um, peculiarities of pediatric tear film and ocular surface. The, the tear film and the ocular surface of children are different. And the uh, most important things, we, we cannot oversimplify trying to interpret these differences. For example, we know that blink rate is significantly lower in infants, that the tear film and the lipid layer are thicker and more stable in children. The rel relative amounts of mebomin components are different in children, but surprisingly, probably this is not the right explanation for the increase in stability of tear film in children. Probably, for example, mucins play a major role in stabilizing the uh, pediatric tear film. And uh, what about the epidemiological relevance? Um, if we give a look to literature, and to major review published in the last years, we can read that uh, dry eye is a rare condition in children, usually associated to congenital disorders, uh, autoimmune disease, inflammatory disorders, and so on. Probably <clears throat> this is related to very severe forms of uh, hyposecretive dry eye. But uh, now, if we think to the recent advances in our knowledge about uh, dry eye disease in adults, uh, probably we can understand uh, that uh, we might be missing uh, so many diagnoses uh, of uh, dry eye in children. In fact, now we know that even in adults, uh, aqueous deficient dry eye is uh, a, a minority of cases. Uh, in, uh, in most cases, uh, we may have uh, hyper evaporative dry eye with, uh, with uh, almost normal uh, uh, tear film volume and secretion. So probably we don't have to look at uh, tear volume in children, but we have to look to the interaction between tear film and the ocular surface. We can try to move in the next few minutes uh, from adults to children, trying to understand peculiarities, for example, of the spectors. In this case, we, we can see the uh, most well studied spectors in adults. But in children, we may have peculiar respectors or peculiar findings in respectors common 
in adolescent children. For example, so for, for example uh, together with other groups, uh, we demonstrated a strong rationale for uh, ocular allergies, uh, severe ocular allergies uh, as a risk factor for dry eye. And uh, other groups studied uh, the use, uh, the prolonged use of smartphones in children uh, as a risk factor for dry eye. And uh, we also studied the role of environmental pollution and the impact of the pediatric ocular surface that probably is a bit different than the impact in adults. And uh, what about the assessment of the ocular surface in children? You know that uh, we need to assess symptoms and signs for the diagnosis. And uh, we have obviously challenges peculiar of children uh, about symptoms. We need to divide, uh, differentiate preverbal and verbal age. But even in uh, verbal age, children will have uh, peculiar patterns of symptoms. And uh, which is the ideal tool to assess symptoms? In adults, we have standardized questionnaires, but we don't have that dedicated to children. And uh, questionnaires are the ideal tool, or visual analog scales, or other tools. And uh, other problems are related to the interpretation of symptoms. For example, we know that uh, um, several groups have demonstrated that uh, mild to moderate uh, chronic symptoms uh, are usually underreported in children compared to. Uh, edits. And uh, things are even a bit more complicated uh, looking at the assessment uh, of science. Uh, you know, in, in, we need to assess uh, TRF instability, usually osmolarity in adults, uh, ocular surface staining, and TR film volume and secretion, and the moyen glands. All these things are different in children. And uh, we have uh, specific challenges related to the cooperation of children, related to the thresholds uh, for dry eye diagnosis, uh, which are probably different in children compared to adults. And we don't have evidence of uh, standardized approach for children and to um, validate the thresholds in the pediatric population. Uh, probably, for example, we can try to use uh, non-invasive uh, assessment uh, of the ocular surface of tear film. For example, to assess uh, tear volume and secretion, Schirmer test uh, is, uh, is uh, an, uh, an annoying procedure, not uh, suitable for children. We can use a red phenol test or even better OCT assessment of the tear meniscus. And even for uh, meibomian glands assessment, uh, imaging of meibomian glands, uh, we may have some problems with the unknown procedures in children, and we have some dedicated devices like the pen shaped infrared mobilometer. And uh, finally, a few words about management and therapy. These are the recommendations of the TFOS, the TR Film and Ocular Surface Dry Eye Workshop 2 about management and therapy of dry eye. But if we, if we think to pediatric dry eye, we obviously may have some specific challenges. For example, we talk about uh, lifestyle modification, education regarding uh, the condition, uh, modification of, of the environment. But uh, in children, we have to think to avoid over medication at the same time to avoid the impact of our uh, procedures, of, of our potential lifestyle modifications of the children's quality of life. At the same time, in this first step, in the first uh, um, level of severity of dry eye, one of the uh, most important therapy are lubricants, but uh, they are suitable for use in children. Uh, what the impact of uh, lubricants on the children's quality of life, which is the ideal lubricant, uh, how many drops per day, and so on. And uh, even more uh, problems, uh, if we use drugs, if we move to the step two of therapy, and we need to use a more invasive approach and drugs. Um, we can discuss the role of punctal occlusion in severe cases. Maybe they have some pro and cons, but uh, may be useful in some severe cases in children. Uh, again, we need to minimize the medicalization. We have peculiar challenges about the use and peculiar concerns about the use of topical steroids in children. We have uh, issues related to the tolerability and to the poor evidence of efficacy of the use of uh, immunomodulatory drugs uh, like uh, cyclosporine in pediatric dry eye. 
and Erin um, mentioned the use of oral, oral antibiotics. It may be very useful when we have an important involvement of loin glands, but uh, <clears throat> even here, the clear challenge is that we know that we cannot use the tracitins under 12 years of age, so we have just macrolides, perhaps, with the uh, poor evidence in some cases of efficacy. So in conclusion, I think that uh, pediatric dry eye is uh, an intriguing topic. Uh, we, the, perhaps it's a neglected disease. The first step is to recognize its existence and its relevance. It's a not fully understood disease. So we have a lot of work to do on several experts from pathogenesis to uh, diagnosis to clinical management. And uh, we know that uh, peculiar, uh, we have uh, a peculiar pediatric ocular surface and tear film, and uh, the pediatric dry eye is different and it needs a dedicated force. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Irene, for your wonderful uh, presentation. We have now other people, other colleagues connected from Spain, Zambia, Saudi Arabia. Taiwan, Azerbaijan, Mexico, India, Pakistan, Poland, Belgium. And so let's start discussion, uh, panel uh, discussion. And uh, we have uh, many questions. First is how do panel measure tear film? Do you want to start? Uh, so Eduardo, Irene? Yeah, this is a, this is a major problem. I, I mentioned that Max in my presentation, but uh, uh, the problem is that uh, usually in the real world, in adults, uh, tear film secretion is measured uh, with the shimmer test. But uh, this is uh, uh, an annoying procedure in children. We may have a problem of cooperation. At the same time, we don't know which is the validated threshold for children. So I suggest that we can use a more clinical approach with a red panel test, but even in this case, we don't have the validity threshold, or an imaging approach in children after six years of age, we can be able to capture OCT images of the tear meniscus, and we can try to measure that. This is a, a good surrogate of the tear volume, but again, in children, we don't have validated thresholds for the area or the height of the geminiscus. Erin, do you want to add something? I think the only thing else that I'd add is just looking at the tear film and kind of evaluating the quality. Is it frothy? Does it have fast breakup time? You know, does it, you know, you can look at that tear film and I know that's, it's hard to teach somebody how to do that, but after a long time, you can say that's a healthy tear film or that's just not a healthy tear film. And I know that's, that just takes years of looking at it to, to figure out. Okay, another question. This, I think it's very important. This is very fashion at this, this moment. Is that there is any rational of using oral fatty and, you know, or, or acid supplement in dry eye? Erin, you want to start first? So I think I just kind of think about the risk profile. And most of it is unknown, but I think the chance that a, that a, a moderate dose omega-3 in a child, it, I, I think that omega-3 uh, supplements than I would um, anything else. Okay, Eduardo? Uh, yeah, this is an intriguing question because uh, we have, uh, um, in the last years, we used a lot of oral fatty acids in dry eye. Um, we have also several papers, uh, small pilot studies suggesting that there is a rational to do that. Um, the DREAM study published a few years ago um, put some questions uh, because uh, they, they missed the outcomes. Uh, they wasn't able to demonstrate any difference from treatment and placebo groups. So uh, I don't know, personally in my clinical practice, uh, I changed a lot after the publication of the DREAM study. Yeah, another, another intriguing question, because often patients ask us this, is there is any relation between uh, meibomium gland disease and uh, diet? There are also, I mean, also Dominico Bupesh, they can answer, of course. Huh? Dominique, do you want to answer, please? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because um, we all know if there is a, a really very, very fatty um, diet, it could be um, a, a risk for getting those um, mammalian gland dysfunction. And there has been some uh, alimentary co complements, but there is no really evidence of improving this, uh, these mammalian glands. So it is very difficult probably to have... Uh, uh, a real um, advice for diet, but for sure, uh, less greasy should be may maybe better. Milk or, uh, you know, or derivates from milk, maybe avoid that. I mean, yeah. uh, in children <laughs> sometimes could be difficult, yeah? That's true, that's true. <laughs> I mean, it depends, it dep it depends on the, or, or where they come from. I mean, Italy may be difficult because we, we drink milk uh, every day, so maybe in other country. <laughs> In India, they drink tea, so maybe it's easy. Well, you can drink you can drink milk every day, but not plain milk. So you should have a half and half, or you know less. So that, that's that's a good option. But uh, you know, the, the education of um, of diet is very complicated, and it's also a cultural. So that's why it's much more complicated. Also, everywhere in the world. Vishal, I. You know, the, Dominique said a very good point. It's, it's, to a certain extent, it is a bit cultural as well. You know, having, I grew up in India and, you know, we, we used to drink milk every day. Um, <laughs> in the United States, supplements are really popular. So there'll, there'll be patients and parents coming in and asking us about these supplements. So actually, I have a question for Aaron that, how do you adjust the dose of these supplements? You know, there's, there are no sort of solid papers on that, especially with dry eye and kids, dry eyes and kids and, and supplementation with these fatty acids. So I think that one of the more challenging things is actually getting these into kids. You know, if they're not ready to swallow pills, these are really big pills. And so then we end up with gummies. And I think some of the gummies have like 30 milligrams of, of um, omega-3s and it's just not enough. Um, some of the liquid supplements are better, but I mean, I think to really, um, even get a moderate dose, which I consider around 500, it's sometimes hard just to get it in. So I think we're always talking about just kind of the, the recommended doses from the bottles and not going beyond that. And that's what I tell the parents is that I don't have good direction on what dose to follow the instructions and to aim around 500 if they can for like a, a smaller child and then to go with adult dosing with, uh, you know, somebody who's older. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there are, there are times when, you know, we are struggling with the dose and getting the, the child to actually, you know, have these gummies or, or, or supplements. Uh, I still encourage a lot of healthy eating. It doesn't matter how, how young or old a, a child is, you know, a lot of antioxidants, you know, uh, fresh fruits and things like that. Because I think long-term, um, you know, they, we have to sort of move away from the supplements and, and get to a sort of more healthy diet. As Dominique said, it's a probably a different conversation, but really relevant to this topic. Vishal, Vishal excuse me. Uh, uh, do you, can, can I make another question or uh, from uh, audience or? Yeah, we have time, please. Yeah. Yeah, time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is also a popular, this is another question that is very popular among uh, parents. And um, there is uh, any, Eduardo, I want to ask this to you because I know uh, you, you wrote about this. There is any relation between a dry eye and uh, electronics, you know, or digital screen? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's supposed that uh, the prolonged use of devices may be a risk factor for evaporate dry eye in children. Obviously, it is very difficult to, to demonstrate that because, uh, first of all, we don't know exactly how we can measure dry eye in children. So, for example, we can demonstrate that we have uh, a lower uh, TR film stability in children with the prolonged use of uh, electronic devices and uh, smartphones specifically, but uh, we, we, we don't know if uh, using the uh, breakup time threshold uh, standardized for adults, uh, we can do diagnosis in children. So we are observing just uh, uh, data different uh, from uh, what we are looking for, or we are looking at the sign of the disease. And uh, just one thing, probably uh, we can 
we can know that we are in front of a disease when we have some peculiar patterns of puntite keratopathy in children. We have staining of the upper surface, and in that case, probably we need to try to change something. And uh, just one thing, Max, I was uh, thinking about uh, the, the previous question about uh, diet and um, fatty acid supplementation. I think that uh, we can try to differentiate the, the issue related to diet and the issue related to fatty acid supplementation. In dry eye, usually, when we use fatty acid supplementation, we do that not to try to impact on the bone and glands, but to try to impact on ocular surface inflammation. It's a, it's a way to try to modulate inflammation of the ocular surface. Probably this is not the case in children, but in children, we may have a strong rationale to use that for meibomian glands, because uh, while in adults, uh, we have uh, mostly hypercaracterization of the ducts uh, and glands atrophy, in children, uh, we have mostly uh, changes in the meibomian glands quality. So probably there, there is a role for diet uh, and uh, supplementation, but it's very difficult to demonstrate uh, a clinical impact of uh, uh, the changes of diet and so on. That's true. Okay, thank you. Erin, er er Erin, there is a question for you. Is how long is the probing uh, effective in children? Well, and this kind of goes back to what Eduardo was saying, that it's really hard to measure these things. You know, I would, I've gone back and I had fellows, you know, look through all the patients that I've probed and, you know, so many of them don't come back. Um, the ones who do come back, you know, are, are selecting themselves on the ones who didn't get better. Um, I'd say six to 12 months is kind of what I expect and what I tell the family. Like overall, we, we're probably going to get some benefit over that time. And there's been cases where, you know, I've never needed to do anything again. And then there's, there have been cases where a month later when I see them back, they're all occluded. So I don't have good data on this. I'd love to, at some point in time, the numbers are just too small and, you know, the follow-up is just too poor. Bupesh, so, uh, Dominique, and also Bupesh, because uh, we oh, want yeah. also to know about his um, opinion. Uh, it's it's very difficult, of course, to evaluate the ocular surface of, in children, but uh, we have now some devices like uh, non-invasive uh, breakup time, and which is quite easier uh, to do uh, over six, uh, six years old, and so could be a good option, and I'm working on that, and should be good. Thank you, Dominique. Bupesh, do you want to add something or on these um, issues just... Uh... Yeah, your question is related to uh, how to do meibomian gland massage, or you're asking uh, the how to deal with. I think I, I will uh, cover few of things in uh, my talk in BKC, but uh, I, I use particularly uh, some sort of uh, buds. It was very commonly available in use of cotton, and use of some lid spatula also. That is actually much more easier as compared. I, I feel much more uh, comfortable to the kid for massaging that meibomian gland, and then squeeze on the bud. So two buds and squeeze in between this, and it actually happens. It, it hardly takes a few seconds. And uh, I, I was seeing that uh, video of Erin Stoll. I was little uh, concerned about that needle can hit that cornea. I was just concerned about that. So that's the only thing. Okay, thank you, Michal. Do you um, want? Do you have other questions? Yeah, there is another question actually. It says uh, somebody has asked if Erin or Eduardo use cyclosporin eye drops or liftegrast, that's Zydra, uh, for cases with MGD and dry eyes. Uh, yes, in, in, actually in Europe we don't have uh, liftegrast, uh, but uh, we have cyclosporin, but. Uh, um, I think that we cannot make a relationship between MGD-related dry eye and the use of cyclosporin. We can probably do that when we have very severe chronic inflammation that we are not able to control with the first step medical therapy. For example, if we, are, if we have children which are steroidal dependent, in that case, uh, we need to have uh, a um, steroid sparing therapy and we can uh, consider the use of cyclosporine. 
but uh, usually this is limited to very, very severe cases. At, at the same time, just to give a message, and I think that we all can agree, is that uh, as Erin showed before, she, she showed a very severe case of uh, uh, coronal vascularization uh, related to mevalian gland changes. And in that case, we can consider probing and other mechanical um, uh, maneuvers uh, on the eyelid margin. But uh, probably we need to limit uh, these types of procedures to severe cases because we have uh, so many cases of mild to moderate MGD in children, but we have to pay attention to make uh, mechanical procedures on the lead margin because we may have uh, um, very strong uh, concerns about uh, uh, reparative and regenerative uh, reaction of the lead margin after the procedure. Thank you. Erin, quick comment and then we move on to the next speaker. I completely agree with, with the drugs, which was the initial question with everything Eduardo said. And yeah, this is, I think that the, the probing procedure is only to be considered one when there's severe corneal disease and two when you've tried everything else. So I agree. And I do worry that, you know, we're causing, and that's why I'm, I do it under anesthesia to protect the eye and the cornea and the child, and then try and be as atraumatic as possible. And that's why I like that sort of dull end of the, of the safety pin with the hope that you're just opening the top and not doing damage inside, but I agree. Thank you. All right, uh, fantastic discussion. Thank you, everyone. Um, it gives me pleasure to invite our next speaker, uh, Dominic Bremont from France. Uh, she's gonna talk about management of atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Dominic, please share the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me and do you see the screen? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so thank you. I'm very happy to to find everyone in the in over uh, so many countries and uh, to speak about management of atopic character conjunctivitis. And um, we know that uh, atopic character conjunctivitis is a severe form of ocular allergy. And it's uh, characterized by ongoing atopic uh, dermatitis and, uh, uh, and also um, with blepharitis. With a dif differential diagnosis um, is uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, but it's also associated with dry eye and, and very often mis- and underdiagnosed in children. There is multiple forms also of AKC from mild to severe and must be recognized because it must be done for the evaluation of the prognosis and the treatment must be adapted also. Uh, we know that ocular allergy is estimated at six or 30% of the population. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really many, many children. Um, so uh, we have also the, the different clinical forms, and as you see for the severe forms, it's mainly vernal a atopic or conjunctivitis, and sometimes difficult to differentiate. Um, so what are the clinical signs? We know that it's a rare disease in children. Uh, usually this is um, a disease that just uh, go on, um, on patients to 30 to 50 years old with photophobia, visual impairment, alter quality of life. It's associated with dry uh, blepharitis, with madarosis usually in children, with a Denny Morgan fold and a superior and inferior with SPK, of course. And complications, it's similar to vernal conjunctivitis with shield ulcer and plaques. So if just we go there, uh, itching is a quite constant sign with photophobia, but not very, um, very significant, mucus discharge and grittiness as dryness and ocular burning. So if we go to the examination, first of all, you need to revert the eyelid systematically because not very easy sometimes in children, but you, you have to do it to see if there is giant papilla, to look at the transverse dots. And, and sometimes you have that only on the superior uh, limbus and to look at the lower fornix because you can see the uh, infiltration, which is, which is very different from VKC. Uh, so I guess in children, of course, exist and so need to be differentiated. Of, on, uh, and so the, the point is, 
ongoing eyelid eczema just with the keratoconjunctivitis or blepharal keratoconjunctivitis. And just look at this child. Uh, he has double fold of Denny Morgan, uh, here in the superior eyelid, but also in the, in the inferior. And uh, you can go uh, look at the um, uh, fissures on ears and, and the countries. We have the possibility to score the blepharal keratoconjunctivitis in, uh, in three uh, options like AKC, VKC, and rosacea. We remember that uh, ocular rosacea is a very severe, sometimes dryness uh, and membrane gland dysfunction in children. And um, so we see that AKC is mostly um, characterized by uh, atopic dermatitis and uh, eczema in, infant, in infancy. Um, asthma, rhinitis, and keratitis or conjunctivitis is not very differentiating what you see for VKC, but uh, you have so those uh, possibilities to observe as madarosis and uh, Denny Morgan fold. Uh, at the contrary, in VKC, there is long eyelashes. And in rosacea, you can characterize by conjunctival flitinary. And uh, we can also uh, go to the corneal evaluation with the Oxford scale. So if just we summarize the differences, um, it's blepharitis in AKC, uh, double fold, um, and the most important is does not end at adolescence. So this is a different prognosis, and this is uh, to be known to the parents. We can have complications as stunted dots, uh, vernal, iatrogenic complication, and so there is a blindness risk with steroids. And so why uh, going for the, this blindness risk is not uh, important. So just uh, to look at those complications here, and uh, we need also to have a follow-up with a dermatologic examination. It is very important to find out about uh, this skin, di skin disease um, just with atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, we have also the, in, the importance of allergenic tests and pre can patch tests, uh, pre-test mostly, and the uh, uh, CAC model also with provocation allergenic tests uh, when you have identified the allergen. Well, I will not go very, uh, I will go very quickly for the mechanism, but you see that the reconial inflammation and ethylene toxicity with cytokines. Uh, so about the treatment, um, and the treatment is uh, classical therapy first, uh, uh, eyelid hygiene washing, ocular dryness should be, uh, should be corrected with lacrimal substitutes. And I really recommend something very important is a preservative free. And uh, for every, um, I say that for every pathology in children, if you can have that, go to a preservative free. UV protection is good also. Avoid irritating factors, are air conditioning, pollution. Um, so um, if you have all this environmental uh, treatment, we can go to mast cell stabilizer and antihistamines, but usually uh, they do not work alone in acute phases. Uh, so steroid could be used, of course, with high doses, short treatment in acute phase, but never on a long-term treatment because it is, it is really um, a, a blindness risk and steroid dependence. And so immunomodulators are the very good answer for it here. And so why we have uh, so uh, new therapy, steroid iatrogenicity, it's because of this problem of iatrogenous complication with uh, um, with cyclosporine, uh, with uh, steroids. So cyclosporine as a mechanism of action, as a inhibition of calcinorin, and you see here uh, the, the action here, and it should be very interesting. And you just look at this young child with the, the treatment. Uh, tacrolimus is very useful also, and uh, can be used um, 
for the treatment of moderate to severe atopic eyelid disease. Uh, we do not have it in, uh, in Europe, we do not have the tachyremus of thalamic suspension uh, very easily. Uh, it, it could be good maybe in uh, in next future to have it. Uh, and uh, the ointment is very useful for the eyelids, but it also improves the keratitis usually. So new therapies, new insight. We have seen cyclosporine tacrolimus, but we see that we have uh, other topical calcineurin inhibitors or other mechanism drugs potential. So AKC before and after treatment here, you can see improvement of the eyelid, but also improvement in, um, in the, the giant papilla. So what are the take home message for AKC is uh, earlier clinical diagnosis of AKC make the difference in the follow up and the prognosis. So don't miss the washing, don't, don't miss the uh, environmental measures, go to dermatologic allergic checkup, uh, go to lubricants for dry eye, but preservative free, uh, go to steroid sparing drugs, uh, cyclosporine or tacrolimus, and uh, adapted treatment, improve quality of life and avoid iatrogenic vision threatening complications. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I think we can move forward to Bupesh for the next presentation. Thank you, Bupesh. It's all yours. Uh, Bupesh, Hello. before before sorry, Bupesh, before starting, uh, I want to remind people to do the main team major questions. Okay. Uh, we shall do want to remind the, the code if you still have that. Sorry for this. Yes, I'll, I'll still have that. We'll put that in the comment section. Okay. Am I audible? And my slides are visible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I would uh, sincerely like to thank uh, WCS POS for giving me this opportunity. And uh, as previous speakers have uh, spoken about different types of keratoconjunctivitis, I will add mine is in blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. So by definition, blepharokeratoconjunctivitis has three arms. One is anterior and posterior lid margin inflammation, blepharitis, plus episodes of conjunctivitis, and plus keratopathy. So if these three things are there, then we will call as blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. In keratopathy, the lesions can be either punctuate lesions or punctuate keratitis, flictans, marginal keratitis, or corneal ulcerations. This is not that much uncommon to see a patient or kid having blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. In one of the study, it is almost equivalent to as trauma or congenital corneal opacities or even herpes simplex virus. So almost 17 to 20% cases of kids inflammation can be having blepharokeratoconjunctivitis in few studies. The most common symptoms, as you can see here, is the photophobia. Many of the time, these kids are not able to see the light and they use dark glasses. And many times the chief complaint of the mother or father that they're not opening their light and they're not going in sunlight. And that's sometimes they feel that this is very common for kids. But when we tell them that this is a severe problem they are having. So uh, that is the first complaint many a times I see in patients of two year, even three year babies are having this type of problem. Then science wise, the most common important sign is the, the mebomitis or blepharitis is the most common, followed by corneal signs. If you stain them, you, they will start having marginal infiltrates or subepithelial lesions or punctal staining. So if you combine these three or four, you come to a diagnosis that this kid is having blepharocatochemitis and you need to find the cause of that. Like this is the example of typical blepharocatechogenomatis when you are started, when you start seeing the lesions of little bit of uh, punctate staining around the limbus on the cornea. And if you stain it, you will see that multiple punctate staining here, along with thick mebonian discharge and all mebonian glands are blocked with uh, all the lashes are having discharge and conjunctival vessels. And this is, as you can see, the child is not able to open the 
I while uh, having a strong blepharospasm, so not able to take entire cornea photo as well. So this has been scored in terms of activity and damage. Like if you having absence of conjunctival inflammation or limbitis or ocular surface ulceration, this will call as grade zero, grade score zero or grade none. Followed by mild, where you are having conjunctival hyperemia or mild conjunctival stromal edema or active peripheral new vessels involving less than three clock hours, we we'll call it as mild. Moderate, if you are having more than three clock hours of active peripheral vessels along with extensive or marked conjunctival hyperemia, this is called as moderate or give you scale of score of two. With a followed by severity, this is basically a score to assess and to guide your treatment and to make your diagnosis followed by damage also having like lid margin distortion or keratinization in terms of scoring it will come as if they are absent then will call as zero if they are present then will call as mild and then followed by severity wise they can be rated as mild moderate or to severe this can be seen in this picture also that you can see the mild punctate staining followed by severe punctate staining and there are these leash of vessels coming to the picture coming till the center of the cornea with dense scarring along with uh, like this is the severe form of the uh, BKC where you're having corneal perforation in the center. Similar can be seen in the meibonian gland associated meibonian gland disorder also where you can see the meibonian glands are almost blocked or absent and similar in the corneal picture having a corneal perforation with iris prolapse. So coming to the differential diagnosis whenever a patient of this type of presentation comes to us, we need to make a diagnosis of meibomitis, related keratoconjunctivitis, staphylococcal bilifaritis, HSV keratitis, demodex infestation, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, and pediatric ocular rosacea. Many of uh, these dis uh, diseases are already covered by previous talk. So like this picture of a patient or having severe allergy, you see examined from, from the lid margin to, to the lid margin to the lashes, almost they are on within normal limit based upon uh, the examination. But you see the limbal is having one follicle with, with some sort of frontal spots with are having a dot staining. So that is basically a patient of limbal, you can say VKC and responded to uh, master, st master stabilizers and topical steroids. In, in, in change to this baby was having a limbus inflammation along with this is the raised area with leash of vessels. So this was a sort of marginal keratitis where actually came out to be PCR and IFA positive for uh, HSV. So to, to targets of the treatment is always towards opening of meibomian gland openings or bacteria flora of lid margin or to reduce ocular surface inflammation in terms of BKC. In terms of bacteria flora, few of the studies have shown that 34% of cases, 17 to 34% of cases actually considered positive for staphylococci and in those cases actually responded well. But in those cases, there are always some ulcers on the lid margin. But if without ulcers, the culture positivity is almost zero. Is systemic treatment required? Many times this question asked to us, so there is no RCT as such to say whether systemic treatment works for BKC or not, because no control group also to compare. But we have seen tetracycline works, but not indicated for kids. Oral macrolides, which I always recommend and always we give in terms of erythromycin or erythromycin. Bitter active antibiotics, if they are staphylococcus positive and having ulceration actually works in four to five days treatment actually works. Essential fatty acids that we were discussing previously in the diet modification. Oral immunosuppressants or steroids are very severe form of pneumonian gland, or you can say rosacea, or other forms of a very severe lid margin inflammation where it is uncontrollable and causing corneal uh, blindness. We can use it, but there's no proven study to prove their efficacy. So this is like a step ladder approach where you can increasing the modification from dietary modifications to addition of topical corticosteroids to addition of oral tetracycline or macrolides along or cyclosporine like we are using here tetrolimus ointment in those conditions along with and to, to most severe in the case of immunosuppression. I will show some cases uh, just to summarize my, uh, my talk. So this is a baby of five year old girl with a history of severe photophobia, almost two and a half years on topical steroids and lubricants and antihistaminics as uh, we, can, we have seen this picture before. 
and these are the like you can see superficial leash of vessels coming and uh, so these are plenty of lashes were having actually called right cuff and on on close examination you can see the base of lashes are having plenty of called right rough and these are basically a called right dandruff which actually a suspicious of a problem called as demodex which is very important infestations and very important cause of uh, blepharitis induced uh, ketoconjunctivitis so we just pluck a one uh, here and saw in the magnification this was actually a came to be a demodex so demodex is not very uncommon and has been reported since 1841 and this is basically i i feel this is under reported cause because many a patient many of the patients from western countries also i have seen coming here for second opinion and they are being treated as a rosacea or mebomitis and with plenty of steroids and many time they have some disc damage as well because of steroid induced glaucoma and we just pluck here and we come to a conclusion that they are having demodex as you can see in this uh, video also like just for putting it as a demonstration so there are two types of demodex one is follicularum and brevis and they resides basically either as a group or as a solitaire the life span is usually 3 to 4 weeks of uh, this and treatment is not very difficult but need to basically uh, come out of this as a differential so always we should suspect of demodex blepharoconjunctivitis whenever a refractory or blepharoconjunctivitis having keratitis with use of steroid they immediately control but immediately off steroid the patient start having severe photophobia and it's not very dis- difficult to treat it because of availability of uh, the treatment as a matter of like can you can treat with topical steroids and tea tree oil these are the few differentials or misdiagnosis many times these babies are having for years dry eye vkc or ekc or viral conjunctivitis they come or to be conclusion so just very simple to rule out one drop of glycerin and with mount and you can treat it so tea tree oil application diluted in concentration to 50% in olive or coconut oil or oculif wipes you can use it for 6 weeks it is you can see the treatment effect of one month treatment the same baby actually started having resolution so one other case of uh, one baby of 3 uh, years who have been treated or the having a right eye 8 uh, months whitish opacity redness photophobia worsening of symptoms has been treated as vzv keratitis then later all vkc and undergone amniotic membrane for un- non resolving ulcer and this was the picture of the cornea when she came to us with a bl- plenty of leash of vessels along with central corneal opacity so uh, on the on examination it was basically diagnosed all possible misdiagnosis was there so uh, we saw that there is plenty of uh, all the glands were blocked as as a protocol we all, almost ruled out all possible complications all possible associations but if you can see the glands are pretty blocked and as you can see in this video these glands are blocked with the almost paste like secretions coming from the meibomian gland so we uh, treated with re- now still baby is under follow up and this patient was having alopecia with tooth abnormality and we did genetic sequencing also to our first differential was having epidermolysis bullosa also but but came out to be negative for genetic testing also so we tried this this baby actually underwent uh, uh, then we did post trial and now this baby is after every 3 months he has to come for meibomian glands expression along with low dose topical steroids along with anti glaucoma medication we still don't know the exact diagnosis but this is a, a very difficult case where we have ruled out all the possible causes so basically having kind of alopecia along with meibomian gland disorder so uh, with that i will i end my talk thank you for the opportunity again thank you thank you so much vipesh for that wonderful talk um i think we we still have a lot of time for a, for a good discussion so and we have a lot of questions coming in all right so dominic maybe you can take the first question um what steroid ointment do you use for severe eczema on the eyelids if the kids are not responding to tacrolimus ointment well that's uh, very unusual because uh, tacrolimus is very effective and uh, so uh, of course you can do uh, you can do some uh, dexamethasone uh, ointment for uh, you know for short time but uh, uh, high um, 
well, I, I prefer to have high dosage for a short time. And uh, usually tacrolimus is effective on, on the eyelids, but I, I can understand sometimes it's very difficult. Yes. Do, are there times when you have to use a combination, like alternate tacrolimus and steroid ointment? Well, I think we, we do not deal with such complica complicated uh, cases in France. But sometimes we can come, of course, we can com combine um, dexamethasone and, uh, and uh, tacrolimus. But if you combine it, you, you combine it first uh, with steroids for short duration. Uh, and, and, uh, but high dosage, I, I use dexamethasone first. Uh, and never, you know, never a very smooth uh, steroid because it creates more steroid dependence to my knowledge. Thank you. Um, another question is, do you use tacrolimus for MGD as well? Mevomine gland dysfunction. No, I use something else. And, and uh, I think we are very lucky because we can use uh, in azithromycin uh, in uh, eye drops. It's a very good. Uh, it's a very good thing because Burpesh I uh, has shown really um, uh, the the importance of the bacterial uh, strains in those um, blep blepharitis, and my first line treatment is azithromycin in eye drops, and after that I go to cyclosporine if needed, when we have a very severe blepharocharactor conjunctivitis with ocular rosacea, for instance. Okay. Okay, uh, just uh, let me tell you a uh, few more things. Uh, we have over 2000 people uh, connected from all five continents, uh, I mean, uh, except Antarctica, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, um, oh, well, I, no, no, uh, maybe 3000, sorry, 3000, 3000. Which is different. And, uh, yeah, as if I just make a mistake to write. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, we have, um, most are women actually, about 90%, and most are between 30 and 50 years old. Uh, there is a, a, an important uh, issue about Menti because uh, uh, we ask about uh, uh, the, um, let me see, we ask about uh, just a few seconds, uh, uh, what is the non-invasive tear breakup time in a child under 12 years of age? We have different uh, answers. Uh, um, so no idea, most answers no idea, then 12, 40 seconds, 18, 20 seconds, over 24 seconds. So there is a little bit of confusion about this. And, uh, but uh, uh, I want to tell all the audience uh, that uh, there is a, um, a beautiful um, manuscript, a publication by, Ke by Ken Nischel. Uh, he published this paper uh, on... Uh, British Journal of Ophthalmology, and um, he studied uh, with uh, Sophie Jones the non-invasive tear film breakup time in normal children, and the answer is uh, about uh, 28 uh, seconds, and uh, that is more than uh, adult. So this is uh, an important thing to, to, to say because uh, I saw that there is, uh, you know, different answers about this topic. Yes, I can add something also. I just go to the, when I go to the breakup time in children, if it's inferior to 15, which is the, the, the low range of the study of uh, Ken Nichol, if this is 15, I consider it's abnormal because it should be uh, uh, over 15 because the, the mean is in between uh, 28, but the, the low, one, low range is 15. So, and so the cutoff in adults is 10, but for me, the cutoff is 15 because it's a low range. Any other comments on this? That's, a, that's Yeah, I want to comment on that. I think one of the difference, Dominique, is that uh, Ken's study, absolutely fantastic, as Max said, it was done using a tear scope. So, you know, sometimes a non-invasive uh, tear breakup time is, is uh, uh, you know, instrument dependent as well. I've seen the readings, uh, you know, in all age groups, they, they vary a little bit if you're using another um, device to measure the non-invasive uh, tear breakup time. So just a comment on that. 
Yes, that's a good comment because I, I lose uh, something else like Lacridiag or, and, and so it could be different by the, the manufacturer, right? Yeah. So while we have a few other questions, uh, I really want to go through these quickly. Um, one of the questions is, is fluoromethylone eye drops better than other steroid eye drops? Anyone, Bupesh, um, Dominique, you have so much experience with steroids and steroid sparing drugs. Maybe you can take uh, it first and I'll ask Bupesh. I, I can take it first, but very quickly. Uh, I really think we, we need to go, if we want to treat those ocular surface prob problems, is uh, good for uh, allergic, is good to go on um, dexamethasone, so uh, stronger steroids. And um, if you want to go to only dry eye, it could be a fluoromethylone also, because it's, it's not, we are not dealing with the same problem. And um, so it could be an option for fluoromethylone, but also it's a short duration. You can't stay on, you can't stay a long time with uh, steroids in this kind of pathology. So you should go to cyclosporine or tacrolimus or other immunomodulators. It's to my thinking. Thank you. Bupesh, any comments? Do you use a lot of FML yeah, I, in India? Yeah, I use it. But uh, uh, from our, our experience, the chances of raised IOP is little more than uh, lotiprednisolone. That's the reason we are little concerned about. So I prefer to use lotipred as compared to FML uh, because of raised pressure, raised chances of intraocular pressure. You mean raised IOP risk is more with fluoromethylone yeah. than lotipred? You're on mute. Yeah. I get it. Thank you. Uh, another question is, how long do we give cyclosporin in Bishar, children? Bishar, sorry. There is Eduardo that wants to say. Want to oh, sorry, it. Eduardo. Go ahead, please. No, no. Just one point, because usually we consider both fluoromethylone and lotopredanolone as uh, soft steroids because uh, for decrease the risk of uh, IOP increase. Probably we need to consider that uh, if we have uh, an extensive uh, um, ocular surface staining, we have uh, a broken epithelial barrier. In that case, uh, we cannot use fluoromethylone as a soft steroid because uh, it comes uh, in, uh, through the anterior chamber. And in that case, probably we have an advantage of using a lot of Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how long do we give cyclosporin in children with AKC and are there any side, if, are there any side effects for lo in long-term use? Eduardo, you can start if you like. Uh, yes. Um, yes, usually we, we go, it's a bit different. In a, a AKC, we have a chronic therapy with the sterling sparing drugs in several cases and um, if we are not able to control inflammation with the steroid sparing drugs, probably it means that we have to change something. We have to change drug or to have to change the, the, the posology of the therapy. In, uh, in, in BKC, it's a bit more complex because you know that in Europe, usually we have uh, a, um, a seasonal behavior of the disease. We have uh, uh, a flare-up of disease in uh, summer and spring, and then uh, a quiet phase in winter. And so the question is uh, to go on or not to go on with the sale of sparing drugs. Um, personally, in the last years, uh, I changed a bit my mindset uh, and uh, looking at uh, um, chronic dry eye related uh, also to the quiet phase of BKC, I'm treating in a chronic way more patients uh, and uh, so uh, less frequently, I stopped therapy during winter. Thank you. I, I quickly want to get back to Erin because, you know, uh, United States, we don't have many options, you know, uh, unless we are going to go to our compounding pharmacies. Erin, do you, you know, use a lot of steroid sparing eye drops, cyclosporin specifically? So there are cases when I'll use um, compounded cyclosporin at higher percentages. I rarely use, you know, our branded Restasis in kids um, because I can't get it through insurance. I can't get Zydra either. Um, so um, I'll use some of the tacrolimus ointments, the dermatologic ointments on the eyelids. And, you know, I sort of encourage um, 
certain families to see if we can actually put some on the conjunctiva as well. It burns a lot, um, but it seems to be pretty effective. Um, and the burning seems to go away after a couple of weeks. So I think, you know, in the US, we're just limited. There's a lot of things that I, I can't get low prednol and I can't get FML for my kids either because of uh, insurance restrictions. So, you know, I, it's, it's just kind of an interesting challenge a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, it's as I said, it's a different atmosphere. Um, interesting question uh, for the whole panel. How often do you see surgical complications such as corneal perforation uh, due to all these diseases, BKC, AKC, and what's the youngest age uh, of the child that, that you've encountered? Eduardo, you can start, please, if you like. Yeah, if you are talking about uh, corneal complications like uh, sheet ulcer, for example, they are quite common, uh, and uh, uh, and and we need to remember that uh, uh, we need to manage that uh, removing the plaque uh, from the ulcer before to uh, have uh, medical therapy. Uh, about uh, other types of complications like corneal perforation, I think that uh, now we are usually able to have an effective management of the disease uh, and we have to avoid to arrive to that type of conditions. Dominique? Yes, uh, I think I've seen uh, as uh, one year and a half for um, a vernal complication uh, uh, as a AKC uh, with um, uh, some plaques, which is uh, very, very, uh, very sad. And, uh, and we see not very, very uncommonly, we see uh, perforation, but uh, sometimes it has been, uh, it has been just uh, uh, done because uh, the, the steroid uh, treatment is too long. So we must be very, very cautious with uh, long steroid treatment. And uh, in this disease may be a, a, a very, a very, very, very bad, very bad treatment because we, we observe complication. Unusual, I think, unusual in France, but uh, uh, maybe in some other countries it could be more, more common. Um, Bupesh, I'm sure you have seen a lot of corneal complications. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have seen. Uh, uh, LSCD and also many of these kids are having long-standing diseases and they have like shield ulcer, infected shield ulcer and corneal perforation because of that and also the peripheral margin keratitis along with corneal perforation as well. So many times they are un misdiagnosed and untreated as something else and they are being treated with steroids and get secondary infections. Thank you. Aaron, do you come across coronal perforations in kids? I haven't seen one related to these things. I think I just worry so much about the, the big scars and you know the long-term vision loss. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so, uh, you know, another question for the whole panel really, uh, what do you think is the role to liaise with your dermatologist, your pediatrician for systemic treatment. You know, many a times we have kids, the pictures that Dominique has shown, you know, you can, you can, kid walks into the door, in the door, in, in, into the door of, of your office, and you can actually see uh, that, you know, there are other issues going on. The kid needs other therapies, systemic treatments, steroids, and nowadays there are more immunomodulators available. Uh, some of these, they're already under the care of a dermatologist um, using a systemic cyclosporin or systemic tetrolimus as well. Do you liaise with, with, the, with, your, with other physicians as well uh, in terms of, as I specifically mentioned, uh, pediatrics and dermatology? Dominique, you can, you can start, yes, please. Yes, I can answer because I, I'm really involved with that. And so we really work together and that's very important. For instance, uh, I cannot prescribe tacrolimus um, uh, as an ophthalmologist, so I need the dermatologist, for instance. And, and so we, we really have a population that we exchange because sometimes they have 
uh, atopic dermatitis and they said, okay, there is a problem because the eye is very red. So <laughs> we can exchange the patients. And so we work together for, for that. Is that uh, the point you, you were asking? Also, and with pediatrician, exactly the same, uh, same problems. And mostly also with allergies, pediatric allergologists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments, anyone? Eduardo, do you liaise with, with your dermatologist as well for dry eyes? Yeah, just for uh, EKC probably. We may have a partnership with dermatologists uh, just related to diagnosis in my case. Um, I think that it's important to understand that uh, today probably the, the, the treatment of all these conditions is a topical treatment. Um, it's, it's very, very rarely we need to have uh, some type of systemic treatment in these conditions. So, uh, of course, it's important to have uh, to work in team with allergists and dermatologists, but I think that management is finally for the ophthalmologist. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful presentation and discussion. But uh, before finishing the, 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 we, the meeting, I would like uh, to ask you for um, a comment, um, each of you. Um, I would start with uh, Erin, maybe. Erin, is a final comment. Uh, you know, thank you, everybody. I always learn a lot from, a lot more from the panelists um, than anything else. And um, I appreciate the discussion. I think it's interesting also to see, you know, the availability of different drugs in different countries certainly drives what we're able to do. Um, I think, you know, related to, to my topic um, on my mybomian gland dysfunction is, is to not ignore the mybovian glands and that most kids will let you squeeze them and to be able to look at what comes out and the nature of the lids, I think can drive treatment in a lot of cases and then to let you know whether your treatments are working. Okay, Eduardo. Yes, Max. And um, yes, I, I think that uh, generally speaking, we have uh, um, a lack of evidence uh, on uh, several aspects uh, of uh, pediatric ocular substance disease. Uh, and uh, we have uh, so many conditions uh, uh, partly overlapping uh, like clinical findings. Uh, and uh, we need to become able to uh, be more accurate in diagnosis uh, and more uh, tailored in uh, diagnostic uh, and uh, treatment uh, approach. And uh, probably a message for the audience may be that uh, you need to consider uh, the ocular surface condition as uh, potentially important conditions. And uh, it's important also to understand that sometimes we need to refer the patient because that condition may become a very critical condition for that ocular surface. And uh, a, a message for, for all of you or the panel, uh, thank you so much for including me. And uh, probably we need to really to try to put together different expertises in ocular surface and the pediatric ocular surface. Thank you, Eduardo. Yupesh, um, could you also comment uh, quickly uh, the use of the punctual plugs and the uh, humidifiers at night? Yupesh? Are you there? Hello. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm can here. You, can yeah. you hear me? Did, did you hear yeah. my questions? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to please repeat Thank the you. question again. Oh, yeah, sure. Could you comment, quick, a quick comment on the use of punctal plug and uh, the use okay. of humidifier at night, the humidifier at night and in the room, you know, yeah, in the bedroom? So, yeah, use of yeah, punctual plugs are actually, uh, I have not uh, used in kids, but I have used in uh, adult patients. So because of the severity and the indications of uh, the dry eye in adults are different as compared to kids. So punctual plugs actually is a good modality, but I have not tried in kids anytime. And uh, use your use of humidifiers in particularly cases where you're having aqueous deficiency dry eye, like particularly in patients of severe uh, dry eye actually helps very well those cases. Thank you. Dominique, the last quick comment, please. Yes, I think, uh, first of all, the, the clinical examination is really a, a critical point. 
And um, if I should say, in, when you, you have the diagnosis, uh, you must go with the parents and explain the disease. And, and after that, uh, the treatment must be as possible as mild, and if possible, with preservative free and uh, less steroids. And so we are happy to have uh, some immunomodulators and uh, we, we have to use it when the, the cases are too severe. Yes, I think we, we had really wonderful uh, presentation. And so I'm very, very happy. we. We had so uh, different uh, different topics uh, in in the in the website in the the webinar. Thank you, Dominique Bichal. It's up to you. Well, thank you, everyone. I, this has this is a fantastic, fantastic webinar. Uh, I want to thank everyone. Uh, we are nearing the end of this webinar, and before we do that, I want to you know divert everyone's attention to this table, which shows the chart shows the upcoming webinars. Please please make note, take a picture. Uh, the information would be posted uh, on the on the WSPS website as well, and I really want to thank all the audience members. Um, you know, people who are who have logged in from from everywhere around the world, um, as Max said, except Antarctica. I'm sure that there was some internet connection problems there. Um, I want to thank uh, the the panel, all the speakers, um, and and my wonderful co-moderator Max. Thank you so much. I want to also thank the 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 admin team. Uh, Dare, Emma, and Akela Acharya. I also want to thank uh, Entoad for their wonderful uh, support uh, to run this program. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Let me echo what we shall say, my, co my fantastic co moderator. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, WSPOS. Thank you, David and Ken. And uh, I'm sure also in Antarctica, maybe someone is listening to us. I think penguins, maybe they are shy. They don't want to tell that, but I'm sure they are listening to us. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Ciao, Dominic. Ciao. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao. Michel. Ciao, Ciao Michel. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao, Bupesh. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, you know. They